Uh, hello and welcome to uh, part 2 of state space uh, modeling. So, today we will be talking about linearization of state space systems. So, in part 1, uh, we saw that uh, there are certain benefits of moving from the transfer function to the state space domain. Uh, primarily, we are dealing with uh, nonlinear systems, we could deal with multi input, multi output systems, and so on. Um, we saw that in the examples of the electric circuit where you had two sources, a voltage source and a current source, you had multiple inputs and multiple outputs. Um, so, today what we are going to see is that practically all the systems we consider uh, in the world uh, for engineering are all are all completely nonlinear, right. Um, and yet, there is a good reason for us to not work directly with nonlinear systems. We actually would like to work with the linearized version of nonlinear systems. Okay, uh, there are a couple of reasons for doing this. I'll I'll explain that. So we will see uh, why we need uh, the linearization procedure, and I'll explain one specific way of doing the linearization, which is by using the Taylor series and the so-called Jacobian matrix. Okay, and we'll end with uh, end with two uh, fun examples. Yeah, so that's the basic uh, uh, structure. So we'll see what is linearity. Uh, then we'll go to Taylor series and the Jacobian, and then we'll conclude. Okay, good. So um, are physical systems linear or nonlinear? They're all nonlinear. There is no physical system which is completely linear. Uh, but before we even go ahead with seeing uh, what do I mean by a physical system is nonlinear and, and then how to handle this, it is important for us to understand the, the meaning of linear or nonlinear. And the reason why I would like to stress a little bit more on this, even though you have done this in electric circuits or what is called network analysis, is because most students are not comfortable with the distinction. Okay? So, we remember it as a definition that there should be a superposition property but it is not too clear uh, what it actually means. So, let us see a very simple illustrative example of linear and nonlinear. Okay? So, we consider two functions, uh, the first one is y equal to 3 times x and the second one is y equal to x square. Okay? And uh, the question I am trying to pose is which of the above two fu functions is, is not linear. All right? Uh, so, if I just plot this particular function, let us say I the x axis is of course x and then I plot the output over here y. So, if I look at y equal to 3 times x, uh, the curve will actually be something like this, okay? this is at the origin 0. Okay? So, when x is 0, you have y equal to 0 and then it goes linearly like this. If you look at y equal to x square, it is a function like this. All right, and now the question is, which of these two is linear, or which one is not linear? All right, so uh, the way that we have studied this in electric circuits or even in math, uh, to answer this, we actually invoke the the property of superposition. Okay, I'll explain superposition in a slightly in a slightly different way. All right, so let's see which of these two functions is is nonlinear, and the way we are going to do this is to assume that each of these systems. Uh, each of these mathematical functions are actually systems. All right. So, um, let us consider the first one, we have a system with a gain of 3. Okay. There is another system which is like this, okay. I give in inputs for both the systems. Let us in this particular case take only two inputs okay. and I have an output over here. In the first case, I am looking at y equal to 3 times x. All right. In the second instance, I am looking at an expression y equal to x square. All right. So, this is actually a squaring system over here. In both the cases, what I am assuming in this specific example is that I have an input x1, I have an input x2, in the other case also I have x1 and x2. And for the sake of simplicity, but this is not required at all. But for the sake of simplicity, let us just assume that x1 is equal to x2. Okay? And um, we are going to assume that this y equal to 3x or y equal to x square are basically models of some physical system. Okay? And let us look at these two tables on, on the left over here. So, for y equal to 3x, okay, and remember that we are assuming x1 equal to x2 in both the cases. So, y equal to 3x, I take x1 and x2, 
and I am going to define x is equal to x 1 plus x 2 all right. So, this is the, the basic e equation which I am going to use. So, when x is equal to x 1 plus x 2 when I consider x 1 and x 2 with these values okay, x then becomes the sum of each of those right. So, 1 becomes 1 plus 1 2, 2 is then 2 plus 2 4 and so on. Now, let us look at the function y equal to 3 times x. I can look at it in, in, in uh, two separate ways. I can either look at it as y equals 3 times x 1 plus x 2 because remember x is equal to uh, x 1 plus x 2 or I can treat it in this way y equal to 3 x 1 plus 3 x 2 all right and let us see if both uh, produce an identical uh, answer and we see in this particular case they actually produce exactly the same answer okay. So, this is exactly what we mean by a linear function or a linear system and uh, I will explain intuitively what this means a little bit later okay. Now, let us look at the second function all right which is y equal to x square and again uh, there are two ways of writing this y equal to x 1 plus x 2 whole squared. I can also assume the signals are being added in the following way and remember x 1 and x 2 are signals which are input to my system. Okay. We all know uh, th this is high school math that the, these two expressions are not equal to each other right and we can actually observe this over here. So, what is the interpretation of this? Okay. So, let us see what is the interpretation of this assuming that these two are models of two different physical systems. Okay. So, what it means is as follows. So, let us take the first one which is 3 x. So, I have two inputs. Uh, it is not necessary to just have 2, I can have 10, 100, whatever you like and this can be written in two ways right and we have just seen this, it is either 3 times x 1 plus x 2 or it can also be written as 3 x 1 plus 3 x 2. So, what is the interpretation of this? If x 1 and x 2 are two signals right as functions of time, all I am saying is that I can add up the two signals x 1 and x 2 and I can pass them into this uh, yeah, system called 3 or I can pass each of these signals into the system 3 and add up the result later. How would that look like? That would look as follows. So, I can take x 1, I can take x 2, I can add these two up in a summation block. So, I get x 1 plus x 2 over here and remember both are signals and I can pass them into a block called 3 I get y okay. The other option is I can pass each of them into a block called 3 which is a model of the system okay and I can add them up over here in order to get y and both these systems are exactly the same and if this is the case this is actually what we mean by superposition actually a part of superposition not the full thing. But this is what we, we mean by superposition. I can pass my signals through the model first and then look at the output or I can pass each of the signals through the model and sum up the response afterwards and you are going to get exactly the same answer and we have seen this in linear electric circuits where we apply the principle of superposition to actually compute system response to different sources. Okay. Uh, what happens if it is nonlinear? Um, well, if it is nonlinear, we have just so we take the two signals again x 1, x 2, uh, and we pass okay. So, we add them up, okay. Let us okay. So, we take two signals x 1, x 2, add them up, you get x 1 plus x 2, and then you pass it through this block called the squaring block and you get your y all right. Now, this is not equal to taking each signal squaring it up okay, squaring it up and then adding them. This y over here is not equal to this y and this basically violates it violates the principle of superposition. 
Okay, so it violates the principle of su superposition and we can see that in the first case y is nothing but x1 plus x2 whole square and the second case what is it? It is x1 square plus x2 square and these two are not the same. There is a factor, a residual factor of 2 x1 x2 which is left out, right. So, um, again if you violate superposition it essentially means that I cannot mix my signals pass it through the system uh, and say that it is the same as passing each signal th through the system individually and then mixing it up ok that is not true for a nonlinear system. So good uh, now we know what is linear what is nonlinear in a general sense we have understood um, superposition this applies to all physical examples electrical mechanical uh, and so on. Examples of nonlinear systems, I have just put 3 over here, there are thousands of examples of nonlinear systems. So, uh, there are uh, your diode behavior, which is actually one of the classic examples. So, you have this kind of a response over here, right. So, in this region it is linear, in this region it is absolutely not, it changes completely, right. Uh, even if you look at a nonlinear mechanical spring, and there is no such thing as a linear mechanical spring all springs in life are really nonlinear ok. So, if you look at the at, at the nonlinear spring again you have this kind of an effect ok. So, all these are nonlinear examples and uh, there are thousands of such. So, while the claim is that all systems are actually nonlinear uh, what happens in practice many times we see systems which behave as if they are almost linear if we ignore certain uh, very small effects. So, for example, I can have a spring uh, which is like this ok, which looks almost linear everywhere ok and my range of operation of this particular spring depending on the application I am looking at maybe it is only in this range right and I do not need to worry about what happens over here or over here because my operation actually happens in this particular range. In this case it is enough for me to just use a linear model right and I do not need to worry about the nonlinear effects and this is actually what happens in, in practical engineering. As far as possible we try to use sy systems in their linear operating range all right. Um, it is not always easy to do so and we will see a procedure of how to linearize a nonlinear system in the so called linear operating ranges all right and that is essentially the topic of of today's talk now uh, why we want to do this is primarily because of this reason the analysis and control of nonlinear systems is very painful it's a, it can get extremely mathematical the computational effort is is very high and so on on the counter if you look at the linear approaches you have excellent uh, simulation design tools you have simulation packages so on and so forth uh, primarily relying on linear algebraic approaches all right so the only option we have because all systems are nonlinear the only approach we have is to linearize the nonlinear system okay and we'll explain how, how we're going to do that we need three concepts uh, the first is the concept of equilibrium point the second is the concept of the Taylor series and the related notion of the Jacobian. Using these three, uh, we will show you one specific way of linearizing a nonlinear system, ok. Um, so, now that we know that this is what we are going to do linearize the nonlinear system. So, first let us look at the general expression for the nonlinear system. So, if you recall, a uh, linear state space system was x dot equal to ax plus bu, y equal to cx plus du let us ignore the inputs and outputs for the minute. So, what we will have is basically a system of the type x dot equal to a times x all right and notice that a is independent of x that is the cru crucial thing a may be a function of time a may be uh, constants whatever it is, but it is independent of x. In the nonlinear system you have uh, the, cl uh, the classical way of denoting a nonlinear system dynamics as x dot equal to f of x ok and f of x comma t is specifically a nonlinear function of the states x of t ok. Of course, in the linear case f of x would just be equal to a. Now, I can write my dynamics as simple example would be uh, say 3 x square all right. 
or I could write x dot equal to sin x times cosine of x. These are all examples of nonlinear system and we essentially are just calling these as f of x. Okay? So, that is a general notation for a nonlinear system. Now, it is very important to understand the concept of an equilibrium point and the definition of an equilibrium point is as follows. So, given a nonlinear system x dot equal to f of x as we have seen before, uh, a point uh, x or we can call it as x naught, some people also use x star as another notation. A point x naught is said to be an equilibrium point of this nonlinear system x dot equal to f x if and only if at that particular value of x naught the dynamics is equal to 0. So, this basically means that x dot is equal to 0 when evaluated at x naught. Okay? So, uh, that is the notion of an equilibrium point. It basically says at that specific point. Uh, x in x not in this particular case, your dynamics are 0. Okay? Let us look at uh, one simple example of the so called scalar case. Remember that uh, when you talk of states, you have state vectors. So, um, in general, we would talk about x as actually being a vector of states. Right? Uh, for this particular slide, let us ignore that. Uh, what we are going to really look here is just a single uh, state. All right. So, let us look at this example of the RC circuit and we can write based on uh, the Kirchhoff's voltage law uh, this relationship over here where the voltage across a capacitor plus the voltage drop across the resistor it basically sums up to 0. All right. So, when I rewrite this expression I get dV by dt plus V by RC equal to 0. Now, what is the equilibrium point for this particular system that is a question. And the, and the procedure to compute the e e equilibrium point is really straightforward. We know that the definition says uh, the derivative must go to 0 at that particular point. Okay? Now, what we are going to do is to write dv by dt equals minus v by rc. All right? To compute the e equilibrium point, I need to set this to 0. Now, this is equal to 0 only when v uh, is equal to 0. Right, because no one will take r or c equal to 0 and construct a circuit like that. So, r and c will be non-zero values and this e equation holds true only when the voltage across the capacitor is equal to 0. All right? So, this is an equilibrium point. Now, this is actually an interesting equilibrium point and we will come to one of this notion a little bit later in a more complex case. So, first of all remember uh, we computed and said that when the voltage is equal to 0 for this model of the system dv by dt plus v by rc is equal to 0, this is an equilibrium point okay, because the dynamics is actually equal to 0. Now, the solution of this simple first order differential equation is basically this one. So, v naught e power minus t by rc okay, where rc is, is, is your time constant basically. So, um, now the question is we know that when v is equal to 0 all right so when the uh, when you start the the circuit simulation with the initial condition such that v at time 0 is equal to 0 all right in this case for all future time this answer will be 0 all right it will it will never be a non zero value it will always it will always be 0 now, what happens when we start at a different initial condition? Say, for example, V of 0 equal to it could be 5 volts. All right? We see here that V of t will be equal to 5 e power minus t by Rc, and for any uh, reasonable uh, say combination of R and C, as t tends to infinity, actually it does not even need that much time, but as t tends to a sufficiently large value, V of t will tend to 0. So, what this means is that when my initial condition is 0, my the dynamics of the system will always stay at 0, it never goes to any other finite value. When I start at any other initial condition, my dynamics will always converge to 0. All right? So, if I actually draw uh, x and 
t as a function of time uh, actually v sorry about that. So, if I take v as a function of time if you start over here okay, at the origin initial condition is equal to 0 you will never have dynamics going anywhere else it will always stay there you can start anywhere else over here uh, uh, this can be an initial condition this can be an initial condition this this whatever it be you will always converge to this value 0 okay. and it turns out that this is a specific case of what is called a stable equilibrium point and more specifically a globally stable equilibrium point. Now, we, we will not go too much into these definitions, but when you look at design and analysis of control system these concepts become very clear. Okay. So, let me summarize this slide basically saying that a particular point of your solution we are looking at v over here one of those values of v is said to be an equilibrium point if the dynamics is always equal to 0 at that particular point. And we also have a simple procedure to calculate what that equilibrium point is, which is basically you equate uh, the derivative to 0 and you solve for that f of x and that is what you get. Okay. So, uh, this is basically what I said in the previous slide that if you start off uh, your dynamics, uh, let us say uh, if you start your dynamics at x naught where x naught is your equilibrium point okay the dynamics will always remain at that particular value for all future time t it also means that if i start at any other initial condition okay and accidentally or through design or whatever the system manages to reach that particular state from that time onwards the system will be essentially stuck at that state forever all right so, that is a basic uh, notion of an equilibrium point and of course, there, there, there are various kinds of equilibria there are saddle points, centers uh, all kinds of things uh, we will encounter one or two of them in this particular lecture um, otherwise it is actually a fascinating study. Okay. Now, we have been talking about equilibrium points we have been talking about linearization uh, now uh, there is a natural question which comes why do we want to linearize about an equilibrium point why not somewhere else. Um, the answer to that is fairly uh, one is a very practical uh, reason and it is basically that it is very easy to compute the solution of differential equations at the equilibrium point all you need to do as we have seen in the previous slide just equate the derivative to 0 and just solve it. Generally it is fairly straightforward as opposed to computing the general solution of the differential equation itself which can be very complex. The second and more relevant reason more important reason is that we have theorems which actually guarantee that if you linearize a system about an in the neighborhood of this equilibrium point right. So, if you linearize the system at this equilibrium point we are guaranteed that the behavior of the system at this equilibrium point is very similar to the behavior of the system anywhere else around the equilibrium point in a small neighborhood right. So, in the previous case uh, we, we, we had the RC example and we saw that uh, the value of 0 is an equilibrium point you start anywhere close to 0 right say 0 0.0001 or whatever it be in a very small region around that equilibrium point your behavior will be very similar to what it is at the equilibrium point. Okay. Fine, so uh, that is basically why we look at linearizing around an equilibrium point. Okay. So, let us actually uh, first look at a slightly graphical sketch of how we would approach the problem of linearization and in the next slide we will actually see uh, the so called Taylor series and uh, a more formal way of doing uh, the linearization. Okay. All right. Let us say that we have this parabolic like function in the blue line which we are seeing over here and we want to actually fit another function to this one all right. and or rather we want to approximate this function and there is various ways of approximating such functions. So, in the first case I can simply have that um, 
at a put okay so let me call this as x and let me call this as f of x okay x is an independent variable and f of x is a function okay so as x varies we have a uh, change in f of x also let us take a particular value of x say that we take x equal to 0 at this point okay and then we compute what is this f of 0 we will get some value let us say it looks to be about say almost 1 okay now this is one approximation to this curve right so you have this curve and one one up one particular approximation to this curve says that I have I know this particular value I do not know the rest of the curve but I know that one particular value well that is that is a good start now what can we do once we know this one particular value well uh, we can actually uh, compute the slope right this looks like a nice curve and one of the one of the nice things we can do is, is just compute the slope over here all right uh, the, the, the slope so if this function is f of x the slope over here would simply be partial f with respect to x all right now this is another approximation so the way I would actually write this is let us take this particular value in x we will call it as a so x is equal to a so at the first instant I, I got the value of f when x is equal to a we will call that as f of a right now to that I am going to add the slope over here which is a straight line right so I will add plus partial f by partial x okay and essentially I get this kind of an this is an approximation now so all I am saying is given my nice parabola I now have an approximation to the parabola which is a straight line clearly this is not true right I mean you still have all this deviation over here which needs to be taken care of so uh, what we could do is now uh, to fit this in a slightly different way so you had your parabola again and you computed this point you computed a straight line why do not we actually try to fit a second order of say polynomial around this particular point right uh, let us say that we are able to fit something like this this is another approximation so what I am going to do now is to add a second order term over here and when I add up all these terms together the final uh, fit to this particular curve will be something like this almost uh, what we want so this is a very good approximation uh, of this particular parabola now in general you may not have just parabolas you may have uh, uh, say fairly high order curves okay in which case I may need to take uh, first is my constant value then I need to take a straight line I may need to take a second order polynomial need to take a third order polynomial so on and so forth all these uh, curves which we are trying to fit to this particular polynomial are basically approximating this polynomial right uh, so this actually goes by the name of the Taylor series okay and the basic idea of this slide is that linearization is basically an approximation of a nonlinear function how do how we do it formally is by the Taylor series expansion okay and uh, so we have already seen what this thing is right so if I go back to, to the previous slide you can see the animation over here it is a second order it is a third order fourth order and so on right I can show this again so there you go first first order second order third order and so on right so these are different fits to the particular function and the way we compute those fits to the function is by using the notions of derivatives we have already seen uh, the first order the first order derivative where we took the slope of the line that is that is the slope of the line over here right uh, slope of the curve sorry so if we add up all these terms of the Taylor series essentially you are actually going to have a perfect fit to your parabola all right and that is basically approximating uh, the nonlinear function and of course where we approximate is important we have already seen that it is better to approximate at the equilibrium point because it is easy to compute the solutions and, uh, and other reasons right so we always try to approximate at the equilibrium point so um, if you look at these terms over here the f dash a f double dash a and so on these are nothing but the partial derivatives 
with respect to the independent variable in this case we have only one independent variable evaluated at the equilibrium point right. Uh, f double dash will be the second order partial derivative evaluated at the equilibrium point and so on right. So, uh, all the derivatives we are considering are with respect to uh, the independent variable x in this case 1, but in general it will be a multi dimensional independent variable right, because remember that we had the state vector which was x 1, x 2, so on till x n ok. So, let us see uh, how that works out ok. So, in the previous case we had a function of the type for example, it could have been x dot equal to 3 x square right, a scalar uh, dynamics which you can call. Now, what we are going to look at is functions of two variables, in the next slide we will go to n variables and see how we can generalize this. So, so when you look at functions of two va variables, this can actually look as follows. So, x dot equal to f of x 1 comma x 2 right and the way I can write this down as one specific example, it could be something like uh, 3 x 1 times x 2 uh, x 2 dot equal to x 1 x 2 square right, something like that. Now, this would be my f 1 of x 1 comma x 2 this would be nothing but f 2 of x 1 comma x 2 right, that is basically this expression x expanded in two uh, equations ok. So, that is basically what we are saying if you have a state vector with two states and the dynamics of state 1 depend on state 2 and vice versa this is captured in the two dimensional function f of x 1 comma x 2 ok and that is exactly what we have done over here. So, uh, this is a two dimensional state space system and we have two functions f 1 comma f 2. Remember in the previous case when we had the dynamics like this x and f of x right uh, with this parabolic thing uh, say I do not know x square or whatever it is. So, uh, when we had this kind of an equation we actually considered at the equilibrium point in this case equilibrium point is over here. So, we considered at the equilibrium point the derivative of f with respect to x right. So, basically we are trying to understand how the dynamics of the system changes with respect to the independent variable. In this case we had only one independent variable, in our example uh, in the current example we now have two independent variables right. So, if we try to look at it visually it will actually look something like this. So, I have got a x 1 uh, one of the independent variables, the other independent variable is x 2 right, then you have your function itself f of x. So, for a change in x 1 and a change in x 2, I will have a particular value of f of x right. So, typically this would be a surface or something like that right. So, now because f of x uh, which is basically x 1 and x 2, because f changes with respect to x 1 and x 2, I need to compute two derivatives ok. So, it one derivative will be with respect to x 1 the change of the dynamics in the x 1 direction, the other derivative will be the change of dynamics in the x 2 direction ok. Now, we need two derivatives unlike in the scalar case where we just use a single derivative all right ok. So, how will that look like? Well, if you just write the Taylor series and you ignore the higher derivative terms we can call it the higher order terms ok. So, we take only uh, the first order terms over here for the first equation x 1 dot or the first state in, in our case we actually have these two expressions over here right. The derivative with respect to x 1 the derivative with respect to x 2 these are again I am repeating these simply are capturing the change or the variation of your dynamics your system in the x 1 direction this one is capturing the variation of the dynamics in the x 2 direction which is why we always have uh, two derivatives. Similarly, f 2 also varies as a function of x 1 and x 2. So, again you have these two derivatives. If we put these derivatives in a matrix form you have this kind of a structure over here ok. It is a square matrix again and um, essentially you are going to just take all the partial derivatives and then put it over here ok. Now, this is a special kind of a matrix called the Jacobian 
and the Jacobian basically is derived from the Taylor series, right? The first order terms of the Taylor series, we are ignoring the higher order terms. Uh, because in general, first order terms are usually good enough uh, approximations to the nonlinear functions. In general, not always. Okay, now we know how to handle uh, second order um, dynamics. How would we handle nth order state space system? Well, based on what we have just seen, for a second order state space system, if we compute uh, the derivative uh, with respect to x1 and the derivative with respect to x2. For a nth order, you will just keep on going until you compute the derivative with respect to x n. All right. Now, note that when I say f, it is not just f, it is f 1 and so on, I will have f 2. Okay. So, the derivative of f 2 with respect to x 1, so until derivative of f 2 with respect to uh, x n and so on. Put all of this in a matrix form and this will essentially generalize to this kind of a structure. Okay. So, this is your uh, the classical the Jacobian matrix and this is where we stop one part of the lecture and um, what we have done so far is the following. So, we have a nonlinear system or we have the dynamics of the nonlinear system. Okay. We have then computed uh, the equilibrium points, we have defined it and just said how we can compute the equilibrium points of the dynamic system. Okay. And finally, we have seen that to approximate the nonlinear function, we actually uh, use the Taylor series and as far as possible, we typically use only the first order derivatives of, of the Taylor series. Right? So, uh, we use a Taylor series, the first order derivatives and then we, we compute the Jacobian. Okay. So, this is what we have done so far. Now, the question is how do we go from the Jacobian to the linearized state space system? How do we get the linearized state space system once we have the Jacobian? And by the way, I will be deriving one or two examples for the Jacobian. So, uh, this will become clear in a couple of slides. Okay. So, how we go from the Jacobian to the linearized state space system is as follows. So, again all of this is, is at a high level. When you look at the example, it, it becomes much more clear. So, first we have computed the equilibrium point which we have uh, which we have talked about and then we compute the Jacobian. So, I would actually include another point over here, I would say compute the Jacobian. Right? So, first we compute the equilibrium points of the system, then we write down the Jacobian, the matrix basically and the equilibrium points which we have, we substitute the equilibrium points okay, into, the, into the Jacobian and we will see an example of how to do that. When you substitute the equilibrium points into the Jacobian, what you are going to get is a linear A matrix okay? and that is it, it is as straightforward as that. So, the procedure is you write down the nonlinear state space equations, compute the Jacobian, compute the equilibrium points, substitute the equilibrium points into the Jacobian and this gives you the A matrix. Okay? Um, a point which we will come back to maybe in the next slide. Uh, which is very important is that the computed linear A, A matrix or the system matrix A is valid only at the equilibrium point and in a small neighborhood around the equilibrium point. It is not valid anywhere else. Okay? We will see that uh, very shortly. Okay. So, if you rewrite this a little bit um, uh, this, so we have the, the basic uh, nonlinear dynamics, then we compute the equilibrium point, the Jacobian and you get x dot equal to ax and this is the linearized model of x dot equal to f of x. All right. So, there we go. Now, um, yeah, okay. so uh, one example is if you take um, the Tejas, our Indian uh, light combat aircraft um, or for any aircraft for the matter of fact, an aircraft, uh, the general nonlinear dynamics are very complex right? Uh, and you really cannot design simple controllers for these really nonlinear dynamics. So, what engineers have done over the past, uh, I do not know, 50 years or so, they have designed what are called as linear models at each operating point of the aircraft flight path. Okay. Say for example, just one particular example, 
if e okay so this is the terrain uh, earth and the aircraft's trajectory basically takes it along this along this path okay so we have our wonderful tejas which is actually flying around this path now at each and every point on the flight path multiple changes happen okay so what are these changes let's actually write some of them down so uh, your wind your conditions change uh, atmospheric conditions change the pressure conditions change okay of course when wind changes even turbulence and other factors also change so your pressure changes that uh, these are the external parameters the internal parameters are uh, that the fuel is reduced a little bit uh, your plane may be having some extra drag because of uh, uh, the kind of wind conditions which are affecting it and so on right each of these changes every single change actually changes the model of the aircraft uh, dramatically so these are actually called operating points right so as we go from one operating point to another operating point the model of the system is actually different so what people have actually done is to take each of these operating points okay and linearize the system around this operating point okay so to get a a matrix take another operating point and then linearize it over there and so on and so forth so now you have a bunch of system matrices a1 to an along the flight path of the aircraft for each of these system matrices each of these a ma matrices they actually design a controller okay so corresponding to each matrix you now have a controller so i can call this k1 i can call this k2 so on until kn and this is in uh, flight control literature this is actually called as gain scheduling okay so without getting uh, deviated from our topic uh, the idea of this um, example is that uh, this is a highly nonlinear problem, right? This flight path which encounters so many changes in wind, pressure, fuel, drag, lift, so on and so forth, is a very highly nonlinear uh, system. And the only way we can handle it at each operating point of this uh, flight path, we actually linearize the system, right? So then you get this. Uh, set of linear models and for each model we actually design controllers okay so this is how it's classically done in aircraft industry in chemical process plants and so on 